What's up, YouTube family? My name is Shaka Shabazz, and this is African American Made. Today, I'm chopping it up with Mr. Thomas Claiborne IV, the founder and visionary coach of the House of Clay. And the press saint, Mr. Claiborne, has invited me to South Phoenix to talk about the selfless work he's doing in the community, his insight on cultivating standing legacies, and what he's teaching men to help them achieve clarity in their lives. Our newfound brotherhood has planted the seeds of clarity within me as I navigate barriers and continue to build my legacy. So, roll up your sleeves, get ready to get your hands dirty, because today we're making a house of clay. Okay, how you doing today? I'm doing well. Oh, great. I got Mr. Thomas Claiborne with us today from House of Clay, and we're going to talk a little bit about what you do and uh, what your background is, and just tell us a little bit about yourself. So, as we stated already, my name is Thomas Claiborne IV. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I went to school in Washington, D.C., Howard University. And uh, while I was there, I met my wife there. We are now married 13 years. We have three children. We have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, two-year-old. And uh, now we live in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, I checked out your website. You have a beautiful family. Thank you. Um, great. Um, so, HBCU, all right. Absolutely. Okay, um, solid background there. Uh, what inspired you to start your practice? Well, for me, I, I was a person, I grew up in the church, kind of in that atmosphere, and I grew up with learning a lot of good principles that kind of helped me develop. As a man, I grew up with a lot of great coaching between my father, my grandfather, my brother, I've always been instilled with a lot of great principles and practices, so taking those and utilizing those to be able to expand to others who I know that haven't maybe had those resources, um, and I know it's compacted a lot of times like in the church, and I wanted to make sure it was outside the four walls of the church and taking it to the community and being able to deliver on principles and practices that can help people succeed in life. Oh, that's great. We definitely need more people like you um, helping us out there. I mean, these are very trying times. Um, I I'd like you to explain to me what visionary coaching is. So visionary coaching is the concept that I believe that everyone is created with a seed inside of them, but it needs to be developed. So this seed needs to be developed in order for the legacy that you're called to live for generations to come. So. Visionary coaching is helping people to gain clarity around the fuzzy ideas that are already inside of them that they need support and help, whether it's resources, finances, um, skill sets, training, coaching, consulting, all those things to help that seed to flourish and to produce um, fruit, if you will, or to produce shade for others, where that seed goes from being a seed to a tree that others can find shade for or be able to eat fruit off of. Oh, that's amazing. That is truly amazing. Uh, tell us about um, your methods of connecting with clients. So what my methodology of meeting with clients is, first we have a, what we set up is called a clarity call. And then from a clarity call um, that can list for 30 minutes to an hour, really just trying to gain clarity around what fuzzy ideas do you want to have clarity around? What do you want to focus on? What do you want to see developed in your life? And then from there, we would go on to three coaching sessions. Um, one would mostly be involved with what I call the fulfillment wheel. So living and moving into fulfillment into your life, with those are categorized. And the other one really is based around time management and stewardship. So we do a lot of, there's a lot of training out there on financial literacy, there's a lot of training out there on how we can steward well our financial resources, but not much on time. And that's where a lot of our coaching goes into, how do you, uh, how do you work to fulfill the time that you have and be as productive as you can possibly be, but then also how do you prioritize it? Um, prioritize the activities and the things that you need to be done. One of the biggest challenges I have is time management and probably most people, sometimes it just, it's a big challenge just trying to prioritize, particularly if you're on a certain path to try to achieve certain goals. Juggling those things and getting them prioritized and managing your time is a struggle. 
uh, I struggle with that in my personal life. Yeah, and and I agree with that. I think we use time management as our point of entry for it, but then when we really start driving down into it, you really can't manage time. <laughs> you know, time is always coming and going. So that right there is the paradigm shift that we kind of go through within our coaching because we're trying to manage time and it's not manageable. So it's really, the work really comes into what are our priorities and then how do we segment out how we're going to approach our, our goals or um, what we call, we don't focus so much on goals, but we focus more on horizon settings because once you get so far to a goal, you can see further and then you can kind of reframe it and be able to do that. So with horizon settings, you know that you'll never actually get to the horizon, but you're always trying to explore and navigate and grow more, which helps us with aiming beyond success to significance. So basically, if I understand that correctly, because I've, I've never really heard it phrased that way, which is perfect. You can't manage time. Time is going to come and go. It's, just, it's a continuum that's just going to happen, right? Right. What you do, you have to manage what you do in that time. Yeah. With that time, rather, right? Absolutely. Got you. Yeah. Got you. That was more for me than anybody <laughs> else. Right? I, I mean, that's for all of us. I got I a mean, whole new perspective. I mean, that's now. a whole, yeah. I mean, once that paradigm happens, though, like, that's a shift. <laughs> right. Because, right. yeah, we're always trying to manage it. It's like, it's not even possible. It's, it's not manageable. So, yeah. yeah. So we're setting ourselves up for failure. Okay, I'm killing it after this, man. I'm going out there and killing it. <laughs> <laughs> that's all of us. What is the first step in getting a man on his purpose? First step of getting a man on his purpose is I think for all of us, it comes to the concept of trying to figure out who we are. Um, that's a question that we're all asking, right? So, so who are you? Where are you going? What can you do? Where did you come from? Those are all questions that we're trying to answer. So once you go through the process of trying to answer those questions, then that's what's going to help prompt you into being uh, the, the man that you were created and developed to be, like for, to live on purpose, to live to fulfill your destiny. So I think those are the first questions to kind of yield out are, the first question is, who are you? So when you're asking the question of who you are, some people will explain to you their job. Some people will explain to you before. where they came from. Some people will explain to you, but it still doesn't get to who you are. And a, a track to help who you are is really the second question of where did you come from? Because if you can gain more clarity on who your elders are, your ancestors are, and the family, and the, the heritage that you've inherited, then that's going to give you more clarity and insight into some, but not all, of, of who you are. And because some, if you've heard the phrase, we, some, we hear of nurturing nature, but then also another one to throw in there is narrative. Depending on the story that you've been told is really what helps give you clarity of, of who you are. So those are the things that we have to explore. And our first step is really identifying who you are. And really, a lot of my work is helping people. I'm really reminding them of who they are is really what a lot of my work is. Of, of, because it, it's innate inside of us, but there's been so many things that come opposed to us being naturally who we are. There's a lot of coping mechanisms that we put in place to, to kind of be a little bit more like this society and culture tells us who we should be. Let me throw a wrench in there real quick. Cool. Okay. Uh, what if you don't know what your purpose is? I mean, what if you, a young man, or you can be a, an older person, uh, any stage of life really, and um, you feel as though you don't have a purpose. How do you help them navigate that part, right? Because I would think that you would probably have to deal with that first before getting to a place, right? Absolutely. So to restate that as well, if for a person who does not feel or think that they have a purpose, I think that's normal. That's very normal that um, everyone does it. And that's kind of where the coaching comes in place for the encouragement and the reminder of you're here for a reason. Um, so it's like a discovery process, right? Absolutely. Okay. All visionary coaching is all about discovery. And again, even if you think about the word visionary and discovery, it's all uncovering what was already there. 
Yeah. And that's why we use the vision of like a seed, where it's like a seed, sometimes they're buried in soil, it's covered and it's from air, but then we get to watch the flourishing and developing if it's in the proper environment and it's in the proper space. Because if I could take a seed and I could put it right here on this table, and it will never grow or do anything. I can take that same seed and put it in a good environment, in a good space, with soil, with the proper water, with the proper sunlight, and we'll see it flourish and develop. And the majority of us, um, when I think about African-American males, we've been put in very toxic environments, and that's what's hindering our growth and our development. Let's talk about that a minute, because you, you, you made a very good point. Um, not having fertile soil, right? Absolutely. Um, so what, in your experience, in, in talking to young men, or particularly black men, what are some of the most common, unfertile, toxic situations that you hear men talk about that they are experiencing that impede them from getting to that other side that you, you're referring to? Well, I think that was just of the example of a diverse example of other men allowing you to be what you want. There's a lot of stereotypes that a man looks like this or a man does this. And with all of the media and with all of the social structure, um, the way that things are structured in such a way where we have received all that, you know, like for me growing up, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and like sports was a real strong avenue of the way out, but it's not the only way out. And really what I'm coming across with a lot of our men, young and old, is again, you're brilliant, but you're also adapting to the, only the visuals that you've seen. So if you don't have a lot of visuals of seeing uh, entrepreneurs or seeing uh, those who are in the, the political spectrum or seeing a lot of different options of authors or producers or the, most of the things that we see are athletes and actors and from those things and there's nothing wrong with those but I think the pendulum has swung a little, it's very heavy on one side and it's very extreme where we don't get a lot of input on, okay, you don't just have to be an actor in a movie, but you can write it, you can write the script, you can produce it, you can do the film, you can do the camera. Seem like us, particularly as African-American men, we're always put in a box. There've always been this ideal that there's only a few ways to uh, achieve your goals, many of which you just alluded to, and seeing that there's a broad spectrum of ways to succeed. Whatever success means to you is something that I'm glad that you're able to explore with your, with your clients. Absolutely, I think as I'm exploring with my clients, a lot of the, the work that I end up doing is helping to identify what box they're stuck in and then helping them get out of that box. And that's what I step, it's almost, we call that freedom to fulfillment. So there's a lot of things that hold us in bondage and hold us in captivity that kind of chain us up and we feel like we get stuck in. Um, so once we're able to identify it, what we do is we work with tools and resources to help us overcome that. And then that moves us into a space of fulfillment where we can get clear on like, this is what we're here for. This is my purpose. This is my mission in life. And I want to be able to live that and flourish in that and be able to expand upon that in my own way, in my own style, the way that I'm wired, the way that I'm created with my own gifts, my skill sets, my own training, my heritage, my background, all of those things coming together. It's a reminder that no one has ever seen you before on this planet in this time in history. So you have a unique way of delivering something that has never been done before in the way that you can deliver it. And that's kind of the encouragement that we like to give to, to our clientele. It sounds like one of the benchmarks of your philosophy as it relates to your ministry through coaching is um, heritage and legacy. Yes. Explain that a little bit about legacy, how important that is to you and um, when you're talking to your clients and how does that tie into what you offer? Absolutely. So for me, when I say legacy, it's 
I've kind of stolen the quote from it. It's planting seeds in the garden that you may never see is like the quote that I kind of used in the front end. So again, I believe that we all have seeds inside of us and we're passing it on to generations that we may never meet. Uh, my name is Thomas Claiborne IV and I've been able to trace my lineage back to Thomas Claiborne Sr.'s grandparents. So that takes me about seven generations back, which gives me the eclectic viewpoints and perspectives to help me navigate the world better. And I think we all are able to receive that type of heritage and then legacy is what we're leaving or we're, uh, we're passing on to others for it. So that's kind of how I delineate between the two words. Heritage is your history and everything that you've received. Legacy is all about what you're, you're leaving eventually through. Um, again, because none of this has started with me, and because I'm a recipient of all these things, what I focus on is helping people live a legacy. Um, and some people, that's you're starting it, so you're building that legacy. And then some people are, you know, when I speak to some of the elders that I work with, and they're elderly, I'm helping them develop in such a way where they can leave a legacy. Um, but with most of my clients, I'm helping us focus on how do we live a legacy day in and day out. Um, not sure if I answered your question on legacy, though, of like definition. Uh, actually, you did. You brought up some points that I didn't think about, and uh, one particular about older people. We tend to always talk about the young and right. you know, um, us and things like that. And we tend to always, when we talk about life coaching, I know in my mind, and I'm sure it's very um, ignorant of me, to think that an older person may not want or need yeah. coaching and guidance through what they're going through in their phase of life, right? Correct. So really one of my, I mean, my top clients are really, they're 60 plus. Really? 60 plus males because they're caught in this phase where they have all this amazing content that they've lived and they've done it out for, you know, 40 plus years working in ministry, working in all these social structures working on it. Now they have all this content, but now with all the new technology, how do you transfer all this stuff that you've gathered and how do you transfer to this next generation? So helping them, again, taking their fuzzy ideas and making it clear, but then also bringing in additional the generations that can help receive and digest the content that they created and then recult, um, recurate it so then it can be delivered to a new generation. Because again, once you start getting to that old, you're starting to, you have a lot more clarity on the fact that you want to have a succession plan and you want to leave a legacy of things, but you haven't been preparing that whole way. So that's um, really, a lot of my clientele is really capturing a lot of the content that they put in for the last 40 years, 30 years, and helping to make sure that it is transferable and it doesn't just die with them whenever they make their transition. Yeah, it's um, funny you say that because there's a content creator that I watch all the time on YouTube. And um, for the longest, over a year, he's implored older people to start YouTube channels. Yeah. And when you look in other spaces, it's kind of like, more of a, like a discouragement, right? Uh, you know, nobody want to talk, you know, uh, this is a young person's space, right? But more and more for the exact reason you just said, how to curate all that wisdom and knowledge and, and, and share it. And YouTube uh, being one of many platforms, right? right um, is a good way for those people to, to share their knowledge and experience and you know, expertise, whatever it is, right? So you just made me think about that when you said that, like tackling the technology, being able to make it work for them so they can, well, express themselves or educate or share, right? That, that vast knowledge, you know, which I think is something that's very lacking. Now, I mean, I agree with you. I think we're in a generation where we have the opportunity with a lot of the work that I, do and I focus, I call it four dimensional thinking. And four dimensional is, I mean, one dimensional would be like a dot, two dimensional would be two dots, three dimensional would be a cube, so that's all the angles, and then four dimensional is a hypercube, 
where you're looking at it from. There's so many complex angles, and that's where we're in a generation of where you can approach things from, it's, everything is four dimensional. Like we can know what's going on on the other side of the world immediately versus this is a generation that, the older generation is a generation that read the newspaper and that right. from there, and if you find out something in two days, you're up to speed and everything from here. Now if you find out something that happened two days ago, that's it's ancient history um, when it comes to the time. So we're at a space now to be able to take the experience and expertise of the elders and match it with the younger generation's energy. And that's where the blending of that is where I call the infinite wisdom. Mm. Um, because that's really where wisdom lives is the combination of those two. Um, because it's not like, again, the younger generation, they have a lot of experience to share and the older generation has a lot. And we live in a generation of Google where grandparents have been replaced with Google. So this younger generation has so much information, so much content, more than any other generation has had before, but they don't know how to navigate it. And that's where the coaching and these frameworks are really helpful. When you have frameworks that have worked and you can introduce that and then you can introduce relationship to help them navigate through it is really where visionary coaching connects with these elder generations and the younger generations.